So yeah, we're in a series and I want to encourage you to grab your notes. We're in a series we're calling chapter two, a future with hope. And here's what we're doing. Just so everybody knows, we're kind of working our way through the book of Acts and uh, we're studying the book of Acts together. And we're looking at some of the uh, future with hope stories that happen in the book of Acts as a result of people coming into contact with Jesus Christ. And so what we're doing together as a church is we're looking at some of those stories and we're considering how that might impact our life in terms of our own story. And we're learning in this series, God is writing a story. Sometimes we get to places in our lives where we feel like God has placed a a period. I want to remind a lot of us that oftentimes what God is doing instead is put a comma there. And so God is still at work in our lives in ways we cannot see or understand. I talk to people all the time who are navigating difficult experiences and navigating life-changing events in their lives. And I often hear as a pastor, Pastor Trevor hears this too, is this the end of my life? And here's what I want to say to you in the name of Christ. It is not the end of your life. And God is doing a new thing. Let God do something new in your life. He's doing new things all the time. And so we're in this series and we're taking a hard look at that. Today I want to dig out a a trench. I want to dig a foundation for us. So we're going to put our thinking caps on. Everybody ready to do that? We're going to travel around in the scriptures. We're going to build some content. I'm going to lay some track that we're going to build on through this series. So some good stuff. I was thinking about this in particular Uh, because uh, many of you know it, we shared it on Easter. This Easter marks our 20-year anniversary as a church. So yeah, go ahead and clap. We're excited about that. I know I still look like I'm 20, but I'm not. And uh, so yeah, we're 20 years old as a congregation. It's funny that, uh, uh, that when we get to these milestones, people give me pictures and uh, they're resurfacing all the time. And sometimes pictures are great. And wouldn't you admit, sometimes when you see pictures from a long time ago, that's not actually how you saw it going down in your head. How many, right? And I, I, I was thinking about this. I want to show you. I got a picture recently. This is a picture of the launch. That's not even the funny one, okay? But this is a picture of the launch service. This is the official beginning of Community of Hope in official public way. This is Easter Sunday, March 30th, 1997 in Loxahatchee Groves Elementary School Cafeteria. There it is right there. First, first sermon preaching as official church. A few years later, we, mer- uh, we chartered as an official United Methodist Church. I want to show you this picture. Now go back to the other one. Look at that. Anybody notice some similarities? That must have been a preaching uh, like handoff. Go to the next one. You see what I'm doing there? I don't know where I learned that. And uh, I was thinking about that. But these are some of the pictures of the beginning days. That's when we charted. You can see a big uh, sign in the back. It says, says Community of Hope there. That's in the auditorium at the high school. And I was thinking about that because uh, so our church is 20 years old. Let me tell you something else. This June, I began my 30th year as an ordained pastor, 30 years as a pastor. Yeah, I'm not really doing this. Thank you, you're kind. I'm not doing it for applause, but I want to show you. Here is a picture of where the dream began right here. There it is. Now, many of you don't know about Beth. Check out that hairdo. (laughs) Beth, for a time, was an actress on Days of Our Lives. (laughs) And um, yeah, there it is right there. Never mind. Yeah. And this is Sergey, her love interest from the show. So wow on that picture, right? Let me tell you what I learned about this picture. This was a picture that was branding Community of Hope in the community of Royal Palm. And when I saw that picture, I knew instantly, now I know why we didn't grow as a church. (laughs) So there it is. Get rid of that quickly. How about the ears on that cat right there? All right. It's amazing to think how quickly time goes, right? And uh, I can remember still like it were yesterday, we have a daughter that's got one year left of seminary. She's about to graduate where so many of us went to school. And I'm thinking, my gosh, where, where does time go? 
And I remember those days, and I can remember meeting Beth, of course, and I can remember starting this and all the dream that just sort of began. But one of the things that I really remember about that season was some moments when it began to get real to me about ministry and about chapter two stories. Many of y'all know that part of the experience that uh, I had to go through for ordination was to do a, a unit, it's called a unit of clinical pastoral education, and I did it at the A.B. Chandler Medical Center in Lexington, Kentucky. There it is, big intimidating hospital. And many of you know that story I share that I would go over there on Thursday nights, I would serve at five o'clock to nine o'clock, and I would walk around the hospital, I would do pre-surgical visits, and I would visit with people who are anticipating surgery the next day. I've shared that story before. And then at, then at nine, I could come off the floor, but I carried a beeper. Remember beepers? When the beeper would go off, it signaled to death. And I would report to a waiting area. And oftentimes what would happen, I'd walk in, there was a doctor, and he'd, he, I had a chaplain's badge on. So imagine the anxiety of you walking into a room, you have a chaplain's badge on, and oftentimes a doctor would point to a family and walk out. That's what happened. And I would go over and I'd say, are you the Smith family? I would take them to another room and tell them difficult news. So every time the beeper went off, quite honestly, it was very scary. But there's another story that happened in the midst of that that reminded me of the power of preaching chapter two stories, and that's what we're learning, right? And so I hadn't been there as a chaplain very long, and I was in a pre-surgical visit, and I was going around, and I would knock on the door, and people would invite me in, and I'd say, hey, I'm, you know, you're going to have surgery tomorrow. Anything I could pray for you about, and this is the kind of thing I would do. And I was about to finish one evening. And I knocked on the door uh, to the hospital, and I heard a muffled voice, and I heard a man say, um, come in. I thought he said that. And I pushed the door open, and as the door opened, it opened at the foot of the bed and all the way over to the, to the head of the bed. And when I stepped into the room, there was a man in the room who was missing half of his face. And I tried to do what I was learning in that experience, which is why they required that I take it, that I don't that I'm not in intimidated by that, that I'm not uh, put back off guard by that, but I tried to step into that scenario and went over to his bed. And, and, and the obvious thing in the room clearly is he's here for surgery of some sort and that. And I just, I walked, and the first thing that tumbled out of my mouth were these words, what happened? And he said, well, my name is Randall. And he talked in a way that was hard to, 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 understand because he was missing an eye. He didn't have a nose. He only had half of a mouth. And he said, I'm here to have surgery tomorrow. They're going to rebuild my forehead. And I said, well, what happened? And he said, well, he said, um, I was, my life was going in the wrong direction. And he said, I was doing drugs. I was running drugs. And I was cheating on my wife. And I was hanging out with the wrong crowd. And my wife kept begging me to come home. But I'd never come home. And finally, she begged me one more time. She said, I want you to come home. And I said, no. And I carried on and continued my, my lifestyle. And he said, one evening, really late, early the next morning, so late at night, early the next morning, I decided I would go home to our mobile home. And he said, I got to our mobile home. And I stepped on the, the wooden steps to go up to the mobile home. And what I didn't realize is my wife was waiting underneath them with a shotgun. And she blew off half of my face. And so I'm listening to him. And he said, but th that's not the whole story. So what's the whole story? He said, well, um, I died. I said, what do you mean? He said, I died, and I went to hell. And he said, in that moment, he said, I saw all of my life, I saw all of my mistakes, I saw all of the error of my ways. And just when I thought I had no other chance, he said, I felt this force pull me back into the emergency room, and I woke up. And he goes, that's why I'm here. And he said, but I gave my life to Christ. And he said, you're a preacher. I said, I'm a preacher wannabe. 
And he said, don't ever forget to tell people who are going the wrong direction to build on the right foundation because that's what I wasn't doing. And I am trying, as you are right now, trying to take all of this in, you know, the, the horror, the accident, the surgery, the testimony, the, all that mysterious thing. And I got through, and I, I didn't even really know what to say, and I just said, well, I'm, I, I, Randall, I, I need to pray for you. And he said, okay, and, and, and I started to pray for him, and I want to tell you what he did. And I'm praying for him, and I could feel this motion going on around the room. And, and at first, I didn't want to open my eyes, and finally I opened my eyes, and here's what happened. Randall had crawled out of his bed and got on the floor on his knees. And when I saw that, I quickly got on my knees and we had our prayer together. Now, here's what I want you to know. I've never obviously forgotten that story, but I went as the seminarian to do ministry and I got schooled in what it means to build on the right foundation. And I just want to make sure that everybody in, in the room understands, and I want to be true to my friend, uh, Randall, that I've never seen after that event he said, I built my life on all the wrong things. Tell people not to do that. So here I am telling you. When you leave these doors in just a little while, you are going to be given every opportunity to build your life on something. In fact, I would tell you, every one of us who is here right now, you're building on something. Make sure that it's worthy enough to support the life upon which that thing you're going to build. Now that happened so many years ago, but I could tell you I've been privileged to pastor now, let's see, one, two, three different churches, gonna be four, right? And I've had the privilege of, of ministering to people who are incredibly wealthy. But I've begun to notice that even with people with incredible amounts of net worth, when they built on that foundation, they didn't seem real happy. I've, I've had the privilege of ministering to people who have literally built their lives, I would believe, on pleasure. I remember a man early in my ministry that talked to me all the time about all of his newest sexual conquests, but he never seemed fulfilled. He was empty. I've seen people build it on power and privilege. But power and privilege fade. So what I want everybody to understand very clearly is you're going to build your life on something. And here's what I would just challenge you to do. Make the right choice about what it is you're going to build on. And part of what we're looking at in this series is Luke, the gospel writer, has a rationale for this. And when you read Luke, what you begin to understand is Luke has right in the surface of the writing the question, and I want to offer the question to you, it's just simply this, you will build your life on something. So what is the right foundation on, on which to start a new chapter? And all of us are in those places, right? I wrote some things down. Some of us are in new relationships or a job or a career. Some are here recovering from a loss. Some are trying again to be clean and sober and we're starting over. Some of us are new to faith or we're investigating the truth claims of Christianity. Some of us have been baptized. Some of us are trying to figure it out. Some of us are gonna merge with another congregation. I mean, there's all kinds of chapter twos going on in the room. What are we gonna build on? There's the question. And so Luke has a rationale around it, and I want to explore it with you because it's so, so powerful. Now, if you remember on Easter Sunday, we began by talking about the two on the Emmaus Road, and we, we looked back at the reason why Luke wrote the gospel in the first place. You remember in Luke chapter 1, verse 4, he said he's writing his friend Theophilus so that, Theophilus, you may have more certainty about the things that you've come to understand about Christ. So the whole reason he writes 
is that you might grow with certainty. So if you're here and you're not yet a Christ follower, here's what I'd tell you. Start in the Gospel of Luke so that you can grow in certainty about the things that you understand about Christ. But we get over to the book of Acts, chapter 2, the second letter, and he continues his conversation. Let's pick it up. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. He said, in my former book, what was that? That was the Gospel of Luke. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day was taken up to heaven after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know. Times and dates the Father sets by his authority. That's not your work. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the skies as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky for this same Jesus, the same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go. So here's what I want, to, I want us to understand, and I don't want to dance through it. I think a lot of times, pastors, we preach once about the resurrection, and we preach it on Easter Sunday. Well, I decided the church started in my living room. I'm preaching on the resurrection as long as I want to. Is that all right? Trevor says yes. Okay. So here's the thing I want us to think about in this moment. We're going to build our lives on something. Luke has a rationale as to how we would do it. And we go back to the story of the two on the Emmaus Road. One of my favorite verses, Pastor Trevor and I were talking about one of his favorite verses too. This idea in Luke chapter 24, verse 32, where he says, did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke to us about the things of God and as we walked along on the road? Isn't that just a powerful verse? Did not his, our hearts burn within us? I, I think some of us are here this morning and our hearts are, are just elevated a little bit. Because we're going, man, I mean, is, could this be, this is real stuff? This is what's going on? And think about what's going on. These guys are leaving Jerusalem. They're discouraged. Hope is gone. A, re, a, a crucifixion has happened. And, and then they run into Jesus on the road. And I don't want to make it any less mysterious than it is. It's mysterious. Jesus shows up. He walks with them. He tells them things. He eats with them. And then he disappears. Can I just say, woo? Okay? Remember, what was that show? Do, 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 do. Right. Okay, right? You remember that? I mean, here's what, here's what I want to tell you. Here's what I want to tell you. Part of our faith is that. And Luke is not writing, writing spiritual things. He's writing literal fact. This is what he says happened. And so we're kind of thinking through this. And then, so, and I'm holding intention that Luke is writing so that we might have uh, certainty. And then he gives us our first clue as to how we can build on the right foundation. And this is what I'm talking about right here. You'll notice it happens in Luke, or excuse me, in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Watch this. In my former book, watch, Theophilus, I wrote about, here it is, boom, all that Jesus began to do and teach. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write that down. If you want to know God, if you want to come to an understanding of who this Savior is, you need to take a very clear look at everything that Jesus began to do and teach. There it is. Luke is writing for one purpose, so that Theophilus and us through Theophilus might have greater certainty about the things we have come to understand about Christ. How do we get that certainty? Here's how we get it. We began to look very carefully at everything Jesus began to do and teach. There it is. The story begins and ends there. Our deepest understanding of God begins with a careful examination of all that Jesus began to do and teach. I like how the writer of the book of Hebrews 
put it, and, I, it's, uh, and you might write this down, just the reference, Hebrews 1, 1 and 3. He said, look at this. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways. Look at this. But in these last days, he has spoken to us, what? By his son. There it is. I talk to people all the time who are starting over in their life. And here's what I want to tell you. If, if you're starting over in your life or you're starting over in any part of your life, here's just what I would beg you to do. Let that start begin and end with Christ. That's where Luke felt it should start. That's where I think it should start. And frankly, I think it's where Jesus also, even speaking of himself, says it should start. In Matthew 16, these guys are walking through the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he said to the disciples, who do people say I am? Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Look what he said next. But what about you? There it is. What about you? Who do you say I am? Notice what Peter says. You're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. You got it right. The search begins and ends with Christ. N.T. Wright is uh, my favorite theologian. He's, he's brilliant. Actually, Vic is my favorite theologian, but <laughs> N.T. Wright is my next favorite. Uh, this is my best friend who spent a week with N.T. Wright this past week. I hate my best friend. <laughs> he texted me that, and he said, Dale, don't hate me. I won't tell you what I text him back, but <laughs> anyhow, um, N.T. Wright says this. Jesus is deeply mysterious in his book. Uh, I think I've got a picture of the book, Simply Jesus. He's mysterious not only because uh, he lived long ago in a world that's strange to us. He's mysterious not because of what we don't know about him. Listen to this. He's mysterious because of what we do know about him. And what we do know about him is so unlike anybody else and any, anything else that we're forced to ask ourselves the question that people back then were probably asking, who is this guy? And he goes on and he says this, from the cusp of manhood when he began discussing the things of God, Luke reports that the people were amazed and his own parents were astonished. When he began to teach people, they were sometimes delighted, sometimes infuriated, but always astounded. Pilate couldn't understand him. Herod plied with questions, and his own disciples were often as confused as anybody. He is a dominant figure in human history, and we must take a look at him. Now, here's the interesting thing, why I love Luke. He doesn't just tell us to look at everything Jesus said and did. He shows us where we start. This is what I love about it. And in, in, in the book of Acts, as we're starting through this journey, chapter two, we're laying foundation. Here's where he says start. Start, number one, with the reality of the resurrection. We start with the reality of the resurrection. Look at Acts chapter one, verse three. Look at this. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave, look at, many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and he spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, here's what I want to tell you. Don't breeze past that stuff when you read it. I mean, he's talking about the resurrection. He's saying, there were all these proofs. He talked to all these people. He did all this stuff. I shared on Easter Sunday, he talked to the two on the Emmaus Road. He appeared, he walked, he ate, he disappeared. He presented these truths over 40 days. A lot of stuff has been verified this past Friday uh, I went, I don't know if you've seen the movie yet, uh, The Case for Christ. Still out, I commend it to you. I've studied all that, but Beth was gone and I was bored and I couldn't do any more yard work. I said, I'm going to a movie by myself. <laughs> and I did. And I went to the movie by myself and, and parts of the movie I was kind of talking out loud and other parts of the movie I'm crying like a baby and I felt like this guy kept coming in from the movie theater and he was going, okay, creeper on aisle three. Because I was so emotional about it. 
And the whole idea that he's threading through these things, that it was a literal act in human history. And Lee Strobel tells that as a backdrop, he has this moment where he has his own crisis of faith. And this is what I want everybody in the room to understand. All of us, more than likely, should go through a moment where I would determine and call it a crisis of faith. A lot of times when you see the baptisms, that's what's taking place. Here's what's going on in that moment, I can tell you, because I'm witness to it. People have been building on this other foundation. They suddenly realize it's not good enough. And sometimes maybe what we remember in distant past, a, a residue of remembered religion, sometimes inherited faith, we start searching. God shows up. Powerful things happen. Our lives begin to transform. There comes order out of chaos. We begin to see things in a new way. This happens a lot. Sometimes I, when I sit as a pastor and I listen to people talking about they talk about that as though it's the end of the faith. Actually, it could be a brand new beginning. Because here's what I've determined in my own life, because I've experienced it. It's when your faith gets real. Don't be afraid of it. Do what the Edders did. Push into it. And a lot of the false presuppositions that you have built your life on will tumble down. And can I just say, they need to tumble down. They need to. Your faith can handle your intellectual scrutiny. Jesus is bigger than that. And when I'm preaching, I want you to know I am preaching from that perspective because I went through it. So I preach with certainty because of these things. Lee Strobel reminded me what uh, I often think about in the reality of the resurrection there are three things you can write them down, you can study them. I think of it in my own vernacular this way. This, the, re, the resurrection happens, number one, we should look at it from a, from a scientific or a real perspective because when they began to talk about it, it exhibit A, it happened early. Uh, the guys who first saw Jesus on the resurrection were the two in the Emmaus Road. They saw it happen on the same day. Scholars think Jesus died on the cross in A.D. 30, we get over to Acts chapter 2. Here's Peter's first sermon. 3,000 people become followers of Christ. I was over at Good Shepherd this past weekend where I preached my first sermon. I saw the pulpit that I preached my first sermon from. And can I just tell you, 3,000 people did not come to Christ on my first sermon. Okay, But here's a difference where I think Peter had a head start. So many of them were eyewitnesses to Christ. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, look at what he says in this. God raised this Jesus to life, and we were all witnesses to it. It was Peter just going, hey, remember? You were there. It was not only early, there were eyewitnesses. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at what he writes here. He says, I received what I passed on to you of first importance. Christ died according to your sins. Scripture was buried. Third day he rose from the dead. After that, he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of whom are brothers and sisters all in the same time, many of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Scholars think he wrote this around AD 50, 20 years after the birth. There would have been people who would have said, Paul, you're smoking stuff. Nobody said that. Why? Many of them were witnesses. And it has, thirdly, the earmarks of authenticity, right? They were willing to die for it. How many of us would go, hey, I'll die for a lie. Let's make something up. I'll die for it. That'll perpetuate the myth. Who's doing that? Maybe one or two crazy people. Great. Look how many did it. Right? And then Paul says this real quickly, or Luke says this. It's not only just the reality of the resurrection. Is the reality of the resurrection in the power of the Spirit. You'll be my witnesses, Acts 1.8, when the Spirit comes on you, and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. What was Jesus saying? You're going to, you're going to go everywhere, even places I don't want you to go, or, or that you don't want to go. And, and you're going to be my witnesses there because the Spirit is going to come upon you. Now, here's the interesting thing in my study this week I thought about. 
John, in John's gospel, he reminds us what the Spirit does. Let me, let me remind you, you write it down. He reminds us that the Spirit is going to guide us into truth. The Spirit will convict us of sin. And watch this, the Spirit will remind us of everything Jesus said and did. In fact, look at what it says in John 14, 26. We got our thinking caps on. John says, the advocate of the Holy Spirit whom the Father sent in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Now watch this, watch this. Doesn't that sound eerily like this verse in Acts chapter one, verse one? In my former book, I wrote all, to you all that Jesus began to do and teach. The Spirit's going to come, and what's the Spirit going to do? Remind you of everything Jesus did and taught. Sound familiar? So Luke, he writes in the physical Jesus is there. In Acts, he writes... And now it's the power of the Spirit that will do the same thing. I want everybody to get this. This is important. This is why you came. It's not just all memory. It's power. And some of us are living our faith only on memory. This happened. And memory's great. Some of us are at a navigational point in our faith right now. It should be memory. Are you figuring out? Are you looking at everything Jesus said and did? But Jesus promised we wouldn't be alone. And when I leave, I'll give my spirit. And what's the spirit going to do? Same thing I did when I was with you. Remind you of everything I said and did. Here's the question. Have you asked him to help you? Have you asked him to help you? Lord, I've got barriers. Yeah, help me with that. Lord, I'm struggling in my life. Lord, right now I keep messing things up. God, I miss so-and-so who's no longer here. All this kind of stuff. Will you remind him or ask him to help you? And here's what he's gonna do. He's gonna guide you to truth. He's gonna tell you where you're messing up. And he's going to remind you of everything he said and did. And that's the power to go on and build a new chapter. Start and end it with Christ. Lord, I pray that in a powerful way, God, you would break through in so many ways this morning. Break through the challenges of our circumstances, break through the barriers of our belief, break through anything that is holding us back so that we might better understand who you are and grow with our certainty and build our chapter two stories on the right foundation, which is the reality of the resurrection and the power of the spirit. This we pray in the name of Christ, everyone said. Amen. Altar's open. Come as you feel led. Man's going to lead us.